Hello everyone and welcome back. In the previous video we fixed some issues with the leaderboard. And now our program saves the leaderboard data using serialization. In this video we'll add sounds to our game to make it a bit more playable. We'll also build our game to be able to launch it without NetBeans. So let's get started, shall we? First of all, to play sounds, we need to get those sounds. And as some of you might have figured, we will use Google to find sounds. Let's Google Tetris sounds and follow the very first link that we get. For now, we will use two sounds. Specifically, we will play number three when the lines get cleared, and we'll play number six when the game is over. So let's download the sounds by right clicking and choosing Download as. Depending on the browser you use and the download settings in your browser, downloading files might look different from what you see on the screen. I'm sure you all know how to download files, so let's focus on the end result. Please place your files in a separate folder named Tetris Sounds, and then move the Tetris Sounds folder to the project folder of our Tetris project, to the folder where the leaderboard file with serialized data is located. Now let's add a new Java class and name it Audio Player. This class will be responsible for loading the sound files and playing them. As usual, let's clean up and space out the code. And then add a constructor. Let's now declare a private string variable named Sounds Folder and initialize it to a string that matches the name of the folder that we saved the sounds to, Tetris Sounds. Let's also add a path separator to the Sounds folder, like this. Before we move on, let's talk a bit about file paths. We've used them a couple times throughout this video series, but never really talked about them. So a file path is just that, the path to a file in the long-term storage. In a way, a file path is similar to an object reference. To locate an object in the short-term memory, we need to know its reference. To locate a file in the long-term storage, we need to know its path. There are two types of file paths, absolute and relative. As some of you might know, all files in the long-term storage are stored in folders. And folders can contain other folders. So an absolute path is a list of folders that the computer needs to visit to locate the file. At the end of the path is the name of the file. In the example you see on the screen, the path to file 2 is folder 0, folder 1, file 2. Two questions here. 1. Where does an absolute file path begin? And 2. How do we separate folders in the path? An absolute file path begins, surprise, surprise, at the beginning of the long-term storage. On Windows computers, the beginning of a storage is represented by a capital letter. Quite often, it's the letter C, followed by a colon and a backslash. On a Mac, it's just a forward slash that represents the beginning of the storage. Secondly, folders in an absolute file path are separated by a slash. On Windows, it's a backslash. On a Mac, it's a forward slash. And here it gets confusing. If we specify a file path in our program using, say, a forward slash, our program won't be able to locate the file if we run the program on a Windows computer. To address this issue in Java, there is a special variable that belongs to the class file. The name of the variable is separator, and we use it in our code here. The variable separator is system specific, meaning if the program is being run on a Windows computer, the variable will store a backslash, and if the program is being run on a Mac, the variable will store a forward slash. Pretty handy, isn't it? Now, what is a relative file path? A relative file path is a file path relative to the current folder. Doesn't explain much, does it? Say this is the absolute file to our Java program. The last part of the path is the file name of our program. And the current folder is the end folder that contains the file. If in our program, we open a file named leaderboard using a relative file path. The system will automatically add to the relative path the path to the current folder. In other words, we can use a relative or partial file path, and the system will automatically construct the absolute or full path for the file. So if we use a relative path to our Tetris Sounds folder, to enable the computer to locate the folder, we must place the folder in the correct 
current folder, which in our case is the NetBeans project folder. So at the bottom line, we can use a relative path to the sounds folder and have our program figure out the absolute file path automatically. And the relative path to a folder, in our case, is just the name of the folder followed by a file separator, represented by a backslash on Windows and a forward slash on a Mac. Now let's declare two more string variables that will store the path to each of the sounds. The path for a sound consists of the name of the sounds folder and the name of the file itself. To be able to play the sounds, we need a clip object for each of them. We also need to store references to the clip objects so that they're accessible in more than one method of the audio player class. In other words, we need to declare two member variables of the type clip and import the clip class. Now inside the constructor, we're going to initialize our clip variables. To get a clip, we can call the getClip method of the audio system class, like this. And we can now assign the return value of the getClip method to the variables clearLineSound and GameOverSound. The getClip method throws an exception that we need to catch so that NetBeans doesn't yell at us. Next, to play the sounds using the clip objects, we need to feed the sound files to the clip objects by calling the open method on the clips. There are three versions of the open method, but we'll use the one that takes an audio input stream as a parameter. To get an audio input stream, we can call the get audio input stream method of the audio system class. Again, the method has several versions, and we're going to use the one that takes a file as a parameter. Now, how do we get a file object? We can create a file object using the file path to the sound file. Since the file path that the clear line path and game over path variables store are relative, not absolute, we need to call the get absolute file method on the file object that we create from the clear line path and game over path. If it looks confusing, please pause the video and take some time to make sure it's clear to you what's happening here. And we now need to catch two more exceptions. Specifically, unsupported audio file exception and IO exception. The first one is thrown when our program can't play the audio file. And the second one is thrown when the file cannot be found, which happens when the file path is incorrect. Before we move on, let's summarize what we just did. To play sounds, we need to get a separate clip object for each of the sounds. Clip objects are sort of managed and distributed by the audio system class. When we get a clip object from the audio system, we can't do much with it. It's just an empty placeholder that can play sounds. And we need to give it a sound file to play by calling the open method on the clip. We give a sound file to our clip object in the form of an audio input stream object that we get from a file object and we create the file object using the file path to the sound file that we want to play. Some of you might have noticed that this looks similar to how we set up the row sorter dude in the previous video. And if you think this whole thing is unnecessarily complicated, I totally agree with you. But it's a good practice for us, so let's not get too irritated. Now let's add two public void methods that will be responsible for playing the clips. Inside each of the methods, we call the start method on the respective clip object. And our audio player class is almost complete. We now need to instantiate it. Where do we do that? Because we want the audio player to be accessible potentially across multiple classes, we should instantiate it in the Tetris class and store the object reference in a static variable, just like we do for the forms.
So to the Tetris class, we add the two public static methods that will be responsible for playing the sounds. And inside the methods, we call the respective methods of the audio player object. And now we can call these static methods from other classes. So let's think where in code we want to play the line clearing sound. I say we play it in the clear lines method of the game area class. And we play the sound only when the number of lines cleared is greater than, right, zero. Now, where in code do we play the game over sound? We can play it in the game over method of the Tetris class, like this. If you think that we don't really need this public static method in the Tetris class, you're sort of right. But let's still keep it like this, in case we decide to change the program and play the sound in a different class. Now, if we run the game, we will see, or rather hear, the sounds. But for some reason, the line clearing sound only plays once. Why does this happen? It happens because clip objects keep track of how much of the sound file has been played. In other words, when the sound has been fully played, the next time we call the start method, the clip object has nothing to play. To fix this, we need to tell the clip object to play the sound from the very beginning every time we call the start method. To do that, we can call the setFramePosition method like this. This will make the clip object play the sound from the very beginning. And now if we run the game, all sounds play the way they should. Cool. Now feel free to add more sounds to this game by adding more clip objects to the audio player class and adding methods to play those clips. And step 9. Finally. Complete. Lastly, let's build our game so that it can run without NetBeans. Does anybody remember how to do that? Right. We press the Build Project button. Then open the project folder, and in the project folder, we open the folder named dist. And we have our tetris.jar file that we can run. However, when we do that, we can see that the sounds don't play. And the leaderboard is blank. Why? Remember, we used relative file path both for the leaderboard file and sounds. In other words, our tetris.jar file cannot find the leaderboard and the sounds files because they are not in the same folder as a tetris.jar file. By the way, as you can see, our program created a new leaderboard file in the dist folder right next to the tetris.jar file, which happened because we use a relative path to the leaderboard file. So to fix this issue, we delete this newly added leaderboard file, move the old leaderboard file and the tetris sounds folder to the dist folder. And problem solved. Now we can launch the game from the dist folder that we can move anywhere on our computer. It's not the first time we use a jar file to launch a Java program. But what is a jar file? Jar is an acronym for Java Archive. A jar file is effectively a folder that contains compiled code of our program. We get a jar file containing our program when we build the program in NetBeans. And it's the build system that is responsible for building a program. Some of you might remember that when creating a new project in NetBeans, we have three options for a Java project. Specifically, Java with Maven, Gradle, and Ant. 
Some of you might also remember that Maven, Gradle, and Ant are build systems. For our Tetris project, we use Ant, and there is no particular reason why we use Ant. We could have used one of the other build systems just as fine. We're not going to go over build systems in this tutorial, and the main reason I brought this up is that because we use Ant for this project, we get the jar file in the dist folder. But other build systems might use a different project folder structure, which is something to be aware of. So as some of you have probably realized, a jar file is a convenient way to carry your program around in one single file. What makes it even more convenient is that in addition to code, a jar file can also contain other files, including text, images, sounds, and so on. In other words, there is a way to incorporate both the leaderboard file and the sounds folder in the tetris.jar file. And if we do that, we won't need to worry about the location of the sounds folder. However, we're not going to do that in this tutorial because I'd like you to try to figure out how to do that on your own using the knowledge and skills that you've accumulated while working on this project. All right, folks, we are done with this project. It's been a long and exciting run and I hope you enjoyed it. And this is it for this video. In the next one, we will summarize what we did and what we learned while working on this Tetris project. Looking forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.